lesson introduced us to the great and remarkable military career of Samudra Gupta. And it is on account of this brilliant military career that Samudra Gupta was referred to as the Napoleon of India by British historians. But the question that arises in this regard is that how did Samudra Gupta manage to conquer so many territories? How did he manage to gain such huge and great military feats? This lesson will be devoted to understanding the strength that Samudra Gupta's military had and we will also take into account in very great detail the military career of Samudra Gupta. Now the question that we are to address here is that how did Samudra Gupta achieve such great military feats? Now to this end Samudra Gupta created the largest standing army of his time because he needed a very strong and a very reliable military foundation which is why he raised the largest standing army of the time. Now the standing army of Samudra Gupta was so powerful that this was the greatest military power in the Indian subcontinent around this time. So from this you can understand how powerful, how courageous, how brave a ruler Samudra Gupta was. Now can you identify the instrument that the Hindu goddess Saraswati plays? Do you know the name of this instrument? Well, it is known as the Veena. The Veena is a stringed musical instrument that has been played in the Indian subcontinent since ages. But I am sure you are wondering why we are suddenly talking about Veena when discussing about the military career and the political career of Samudra Gupta. Well, allow me to explain this to you. We have learned that Samudra Gupta had a great and a very remarkable military career. From this we invariably infer that he was a person who committed his life only to fighting wars and annexing more and more territories. But we will be wrong to assume that this constituted the only part of Samudra Gupta's life. This is because along with being a very powerful ruler who managed to gain huge military successes, Samudra Gupta was a great patron of art himself. Now he was skilled in the playing of various musical instruments. Now among the musical instruments that he played, we need to talk about the Veena. Samudra Gupta was very fond of playing the Veena. But Samudra Gupta lived hundreds of years ago. How do we know that he loved playing the Veena? The coins that were minted during the rule of Samudra Gupta provide us this very important information on the life of Samudra Gupta. If you look at this coin closely, you will be able to see that a figure is playing a stringed musical instrument which resembles the Veena. So it is from these gold coins and other inscriptions that we get to know that Samudra Gupta was very fond of playing the Veena. We also get a lot of information on this artistic life of Samudra Gupta from his court poet Harishena. Now in his writings Harishena called Samudra Gupta Kaviraj. The word Kaviraj could be broken into two parts. The word Kavi means poet and Raj means the king. So Samudra Gupta is referred to as the king of all poets by Harishena. So this now speaks to the fact that Samudra Gupta also indulged in various kinds of art. That is to say, Along with playing Veena, he also wrote poems and he was most definitely very good at it, which is why Harishena called him Kaviraj. 
Now, before proceeding with this lesson, let me ask you a question. Samudra Gupta was popular for playing which of these instruments? Was he popular for playing the sitar, the veena, or the tabla? Well, the correct answer is veena. Samudra Gupta was very fond of playing the veena. Now, all this while we have been talking about a lot of things that pertain to the military life or the socio cultural life of Samudra Gupta. But the question that arises in this regard is that how do we get to know so much about a ruler who lived hundreds of years ago? Now, that was not a time when he must have made various social media posts to record various events in his life. So, how do we get to know about him? To this end, we rely upon various kinds of archaeological resources. And one particular archaeological source that serves as a very crucial and important source of information on the life of Samudra Gupta would be the Ashokan Pillar inscription. Now, where do we find this Ashokan Pillar inscription? This could be found in the present day city of Allahabad, which is located in the modern day Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. Now, this is the huge Ashokan pillar, which is also known as the Ashokan pillar inscription at Allahabad. Now, you must also be questioning why is this known as the Ashokan pillar? Because this Ashokan pillar was erected during the rule of Ashoka who belonged to the Mauryan Empire. I am sure you are very surprised to know this detail. Because the Mauryan Empire ruled previously, that is before the Gupta Empire. So why is this pillar used by this Gupta ruler Samudra Gupta to make inscriptions? This is because in the earlier times, as in, in ancient and medieval times, often different structures were constructed by different kings and those were used for separate purposes by kings who came later on. Likewise, this Ashokan pillar at Allahabad was erected during the rule of Ashoka and subsequently during the rule of Samudra Gupta, inscriptions were made on it. Now, who made these inscriptions on the Ashokan pillar? These were written and composed by Harishena. We learned that Harishena was the court poet of Samudra Gupta. So, it goes without saying that he was tasked to record the various important details of Samudra Gupta's life through inscriptions. Now, these inscriptions that could be found on the Ashokan pillar are in Sanskrit. Now, these inscriptions play a very important role in giving us a lot of information about Samudra Gupta's very remarkable military career. Now, let me tell you another very interesting fact about this Ashokan pillar. You can see how huge it is and it is made of iron. Now, this has stood exposed to the different weather conditions for hundreds of years because it has stood absolutely barren and exposed to lightning, to rain, to sunlight, to dust, to wind. But you will be surprised to know that over a period of more than 2000 years, this Ashokan pillar has not rusted even a bit. So, this also testifies the fact that the people or the craftspersons who erected this Ashokan pillar more than 2000 years ago were very, very skilled. Their mastery now finds a testimony in the fact that the Ashokan pillar has not rusted even a little bit. Now, the Ashokan pillar inscription plays a very important role in throwing light on the political career of Samudra Gupta. It is from the Ashokan pillar that we get to know the various kingdoms which were 
conquered by him because it's impossible for us to know which kingdom which region which territory was annexed or conquered by samudra gupta so it is the ashokan pillar that gives us all this information now the ashokan pillar inscription was composed by harishena as we have discussed now harishena was the court poet of samudra gupta so it goes without saying that harishena wrote in glorious terms about the rule of samudra gupta which is why the ashokan pillar inscription is also known as the alabad prashasti now because this inscription was composed by a court poet it was written in celebratory and glorifying terms now another question that arises in this regard is that what does this term prashasti mean prashastis were generally poem or prose composed by poets in praise of their kings so these precious these were panegyric or celebratory poems that pertained to the rule of various kings likewise harishena also praised and glorified samudra gupta in this alabad prashasti now these precious these are very important when we have to take into account the rule of various rulers who ruled hundreds and thousands of years ago but we must keep ourselves aware to one fact that these precious these often give us information in exaggerated terms now this alabad prashasti though it is a very important and crucial source of information on the rule of samudra gupta the topmost portion of this prashasti has over time been destroyed because it's almost illegible the historians and archaeologists are not able to understand what is written here despite the fact this prashasti still continues to be a very reliable source of information now this alabad prashasti was written in very honest prose you will be surprised to know that this prashasti is just one sentence that is written across 33 lines in praise and glorifying terms on the rule of samudra gupta now it is from this alabad inscription that we get to know that samudra gupta was compared to purusha now in hindu mythology purusha is considered the supreme being and the alabad prashasti tells us that samudra gupta was also compared or likened to purusha or this supreme being this also establishes the fact that great rulers who ruled in ancient and medieval times often wanted to attribute to themselves divine power divine status now the alabad prashasti along with giving us information on the rule and life of samudra gupta provides us very important and crucial details about the family that is the lineage of the guptas now chandragupta the first was the first gupta ruler to adopt the title of maharaj adhiraja prior to him the gupta rulers who ruled did not use this title now maharaj adhiraja or this title assumed by the gupta ruler chandragupta the first also helps us understand the growth and the evolution of the gupta empire for the time being keep in mind that chandragupta the first was the first to adopt this title and subsequently this title was also used by his son samudra gupta let us now try to understand how the assumption or the using of various titles by different gupta rulers can help us trace the growth of the gupta empire 
So the point that we need to understand here is that earlier on Gupta rulers did not use the title Maharaja Adhiraja. Instead, the founder of Gupta Empire, that was Sri Gupta, used the title Maharaja. And his son, Ghatotkacha, also used the title Maharaja. Now, the word Maharaja means simply the king. So, these Gupta rulers attributed to themselves the status of a king. Now, subsequently, Ghatotkacha's son, Chandragupta I, now assumed the title Maharaj Adhiraja. Now, Maharaj Adhiraja means king of the kings. So, earlier on these two Gupta rulers were happy and satisfied with calling themselves only the king. But now Chandragupta the first did not want to restrict himself to being called only a king, which is why he wanted to now call himself the king of the kings or Maharaj Adhiraja. And his son Samudra Gupta also assumed this title of Maharaj Adhiraja. So this now says how the power, the greatness of the Gupta rulers have evolved and increased over time. Now after the death of Samudra Gupta, it was his son Chandragupta II who now assumed the throne. So the death of Samudra Gupta was followed by the ascension of Chandragupta II to the throne of the Gupta Empire. In a subsequent lesson, we will focus on the rule of Chandragupta II and we will try to understand how he made the Gupta Empire even vast and more prominent in status. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. You can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the Delta Step app to learn one to one with our amazing teachers or to get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus. Master each topic with our adaptive practice technology. Get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests. Get all your doubts resolved instantly. Learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and iPads. So at Delta Step, learning is not just fun and easy, it's rewarding too. So register for free now.